Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. Be seated this morning. If you want to come forward and pray with me, you can come here at the front and pray. I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day this morning. Those of you ladies that are mothers in the room, we want to wish you and extend a, a special happy Mother's Day to you. And uh, we pray that uh, this day is a blessing in your life and that you've been honored. And if you haven't been honored yet, we want to honor you um, in every way. And so we, uh, uh, we want to wish you again a happy Mother's Day. We understand and know also that this day is a joyful day for many, for most of us, and yet it's a, uh, a sad day at times for others. Maybe you lost your mother this past year. Um, maybe you lost a child uh, early on. Maybe you've had a miscarriage, or maybe you had a child that was born and passed away um, at some point in time in your life. We know it's, this is a difficult day for you. We are cognizant of that, and we wanna pray for you regarding that. There are a lot of different scenarios and situations. Maybe you've just been praying for so many years because you've, you, you want a child and God hasn't provided that yet as a young couple. We, uh, we hear you, we know you're there and we're praying for you this morning. I wanna remind us from the word of God what it says in Lamentations. Um, and it reminds us of these, verse, these words in Lamentations 3, 22, 23, and 24. I wanna re remind us of these words this morning and then we're gonna pray. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end, and they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. Let's pray. Father, we do come to you on this day rejoicing in you because this day belongs to you. It is all about you, and Lord Jesus, today is about you. We come into this room, Lord, to worship you. We come into this room only because you have made it possible for us through your sacrifice on the cross and from your death that has been raised, your body that has been raised, and we now have life. We rejoice as we walk into this room. We thank you today for your goodness and your grace upon our lives, for the ways that you've poured out our love upon your love upon us. And God, now we can take that love that motivates us, Lord, to live the Christian life, to love others, to invest in others, to engage in ministry, uh, to engage the, even the lost in our community because you have loved us first. And so we thank you for filling our hearts with your presence, with your power, with your love. We are recipients of you. We are all children in this room. And we have a heavenly father who loves us and who guides us and who directs us, who created us in our mother's womb. We value human life this morning, God, because you value it. We value, Lord, the intricacies and the, uh, the creativity of your hand, of how you created all of us unique and different, because you are that kind of a God. You're a God of, of creation who is creative. We come into this room, God, thanking you for the gift of motherhood. We thank you for, this, for the many women in this room, Lord, that you have blessed as mothers. Thank you for the stewardship. Thank you for the blessing that you've poured up out about upon their lives. We thank you for them. God, we pray for your strength. We pray for your, uh, your wisdom. We pray for patience as for them, as mothers, for their children, God. We pray that you'd give them the words to speak into their children's lives. God, it is exhausting to be a mother. And Lord, they're, a, they're running in so many different directions. We know this. So God, we just pray for them. We ask that you'd give them strength we ask that you'd come alongside them and guide them and direct them. Father, we also know, Lord, that there are, on a day like this where there's so much celebration, there's also hurting. And God, we just pray for the ladies in this room, God, who have yet to be able to be blessed by you to have children. Maybe those who have lost children. Maybe they have lost their mother even this past year. God, we don't know what the scenarios are in this room. There are many more. But God, what we do know is we can claim the promises of your word. And we know that you're a God who comes near to us, and you're a God who walks with us, and a God who, Lord, understands us and like no one else does on this earth. And so we know that you are faithful. We know that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We remember that, and we declare that, and we claim that this morning. We love you, Lord. Thank you for this time that we have to pray to you and talk to you. God, open our hearts to your word now. 
Help us to understand what it is you want us to say, want, want to say to us, that our hearts would be receptive, open, and yielded to your Holy Spirit. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you can return to your seats. Thank you all so much for coming forward. And if you were there praying at your seat, thank you for praying alongside me. Well, this morning, I do want to tell you that uh, I hope if you are a mother that you have a great day today. I sent my mom a message early on this morning to thank her for all that she does for me and all that she has done for me and uh, to wish her happy Mother's Day. We're looking forward to, to calling her this afternoon. I want to encourage you to take a Bible, though, and turn with me to Acts chapter 16. We're going to continue our walk through the book of Acts together. And we're going to look this morning at all of Philippi. We're familiar with the book of Philippians, aren't we, in the New Testament? Well, long before the book of Philippians was written, that letter was written by the Apostle Paul, there was a backstory. And we're going to walk through that backstory this morning out right here in Acts chapter 16 to understand what it is God wants us to understand and see in our own individual lives. You know, there's a difference in listening and hearing. Anybody hear a lot of things? We hear a lot of things. But there is a difference in hearing something and in literally listening to something or someone. When I was a kid, I learned this, you know, not, at, not at an early age, but now that I'm older, I look back on my life and I look when my parents were teaching me different things. There were times when they would tell me to do something or they would talk to me about something and I would hear them just as I was hearing a lot of other voices in my life, right, at the time. But there was a difference when, in my relationship with my parents and myself, when I went from hearing what they were saying to listening to what they were saying. You know the difference? Because when you listen, you're internalizing it, you're bringing it into your own heart and your own mind. When it comes to the Word of God, that's how it is. It's interesting how we can read the Bible time and time again. We've met people who have read the Bible from cover to cover, read it time and time again, verse after verse after verse, but it has no impact upon their life. They look the same today as they did 30 years ago or even 20 years ago or however long they've been reading the Bible. They might be able to quote Scripture to you, but it has not had an impact upon their life. It's the difference in hearing and listening. Because when the Bible talks about listening, it talks about the fact that we are to listen with the intent to obey. And there's a big difference. And just reading and hearing and hearing and hearing and then listening with the intent to obey. That's the difference, and that's a key difference. And we're going to see that difference right here in Acts chapter 16. Okay? We're familiar again with Philippians, the book of Philippians. And what we're doing this morning is we're parachuting, if you will, into the town of Philippi. So we're going to parachute into the town of Philippi and all that God does in the city or the town of Philippi. And before we understand what God is doing and what God's going to do, I want to remind us of what Paul says at the very beginning of Philippians chapter 1. Listen to these words because he's looking back on these people that we're going to walk through this morning and he's remembering them. Listen to what it says. Philippians chapter 1 verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in your, my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. There was a special place in the heart of Paul for the people of Philippi. But there was a day in which when Paul walked into Philippi, there was not one single Christian. No gospel influence whatsoever until God leads Paul, Silas, and Timothy into this city. We're going to walk through the story this morning. This is the second missionary journey. Remember, we've walked through the first missionary journey of how Paul goes and Paul and Barnabas at that point go from, uh, uh, from uh, Antioch all the way over to Cyprus, and then they're making their way up into what is today Turkey, the country of Turkey. 
and he, they're going from town to town sharing the gospel. They, take, they, they incur f- uh, physical harm because of it, persecution, all of these things. But along the way, Christians or people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Churches are being planted, and Paul is, being, is continuing to encourage the church. And now they're on their way out. Remember the disruption or the disagreement, if you will, between these men a week ago. We looked at that at the beginning of chapter 16. There is this separation between Paul and Barnabas. Now one missionary team turns into two. So now you've got Barnabas and John Mark, right? And now you've, then you've got Paul who takes Silas, who's then going to meet Timothy at the beginning of chapter 16. Now you've got two mission teams. But what Luke does, the Dr. Luke, okay, because he's the one who's writing the book of Acts for us and helping us understand it, he puts and puts the, the bullseye or the zeros in, if you will, the camera lens, begins to zoom in on the Apostle Paul and what God is doing with the Apostle Paul as he is traveling from city to city. And so these churches are being strengthened, these churches are growing, but I want to walk through the story this morning, beginning in verse 6, about what God does now in Philippi. God prevented them, and then God calls them, first of all. I want you to think with me about what happens here in verse 6. Look at what, with me in your Bibles. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Now, I want you to picture with me what's happening. This little mission team is traveling north. They're traveling on kind of in the central, kind of central western part of that region. They're in modern-day Turkey. And as they're going north, they want to go east. They want to keep pushing back east because they want to take the gospel to Asia, They want to push it back towards to to their right, right, to east, to to the east. But here's something, something happens. The Spirit of God, God just keeps shutting door after door after door. And they keep climbing north, north, north to the point where they want to take the gospel to the northern part of what is today Turkey, which is, you know, that particular region. The Spirit of God just keeps shutting doors to the point where they begin to understand and see this. They turn south. They go southwest down to the coast to a little town called Troas, and that is where they are. So look with me in verse 6, what it says again, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Spirit of God to speak the word in Asia, and when they had come up to Mycenae, they attempted to go to Bithynia, that's in the north, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mycenae, they went down to Troas. Now they're at the, this is a port city right on the coast. All right, so here's where they are. Why did they do this? Because the Spirit of God is continuing to shut these doors, but he's leading them. They find themselves in Troas, and when they're in Troas, I want you to watch what happens here in your, in your Bibles. So verse 9 says, One night, Paul has this vision. Appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, I want you to think in terms of what's happening here, because you've got You've got, you know, Turkey, what is today Turkey, and then you've got kind of Greece, if you're looking at a map. In the northern part of Greece today, that's where you're going to find Philippi. That's where you're going to find Thessalonica or Thessaloniki, okay? And these are the towns in the northern part of Greece, but it wasn't Greece then. It was a region called Macedonia, and that's where this person in a vision in the night comes to Paul, and this man stands there and says, from Macedonia, says, come over and help us. Now, he's got to get in a boat. He's got to travel across. He's got to land in another town. He's got to go to a place he hasn't been, and he's got to go into regions he's never been. But he's, remember, being led by the Spirit. God was sending them to Europe instead of Asia. This is what God is doing here in this time. Why is he doing that? Well, we don't know. Maybe God's going to lead the people of Asia to hear the gospel at some other point in time, but inevitably what's happening here is that they are being led by the Spirit. Look at verse 10. I don't want you to forget, I don't want you to miss this detail. And when Paul had seen the vision immediately, it says, we sought to go on to Macedonia. Well, who's the one writing the book of Acts? It's Luke. Luke is with them. When he says we, he's saying we meaning Paul and Silas, and at some point Luke joins the, the group here. He is giving a firsthand converts, uh, 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 kind of example of what's happening here, testimony of what's happening here. And he says, at some point right here, we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Well, now in Macedonia, God changes the life of a woman named Lydia. And I want you to look at this story with me. Look at verse 11 with me. It says, So setting sail from Troas, we made our direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, 
and from there to Philippi. So they get in a boat. They get in a boat at Troas. They get all the way over to a town called Neapolis. It's a little port town. They go into Neapolis 10 miles inland. They make their way to Philippi. Why do they go to Philippi? Well, it's the county seat, if you want to call it that. It's actually the seat of the region of the, of the time, of the, of the Roman colony of Macedonia. It's the leading city but we really know why they're there. The Spirit of God himself has led them to Philippi. The Spirit of God himself has led them to Macedonia. So from Philippi, from Philippi notice they end up down at a riverside to where they're going to pray. It says in verse 12, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia in a Roman colony, we remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. I want you to picture this with me. Why would Paul not go into the synagogue in Philippi? That's what his MO was. That's what he always did. Well, most believe there was no synagogue in Philippi. There was a very small population or congregation of Jews that were there in Philippi. And so because of that, he went out to a place. They hear about this place where people pray. And so they're going to go out to this riverside to pray. Now, I want you to think in terms of what's happening here. They don't go full throng into evangelizing the city of Philippi. They're not just bam, 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 knocking on doors. What do they do? They get alone and they find rest and they're going to pray and they're going to plan. They're going to plan. But when they come out to this place where they hear people are praying, there's some people out there by the riverside praying. They go out to meet with them and these ladies are there praying. They meet a woman in verse 14. They meet a woman named Lydia from the town of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple goods that was known for that city, who was a worshiper of God. These are a couple things we pick up here in the text about, about Lydia. She was a worshiper of God, meaning she wasn't a full Jew proselyte, but she was open to God. She would worship alongside the Jews. She was open to hearing what God wanted for her life, what God wanted for her life. And so she would worship God. But notice else what it says about Lydia. Just keep on going in the text and what it says. It says in verse, at the end of verse 14, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. God began to open her heart. Paul shares the word. God opens her, hearts to, opens her heart to the truth. She believes and she's going to be saved at the end here in verse 15. And after this, she was baptized, her household as well. She urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So she goes public with her baptism in verse 15. Not only does she get saved, she goes back to her household. Her household gets saved. All of her family gets saved. And they are then baptized. She didn't do this passively. She had to intently listen to what Paul said. She also had to choose to believe in that moment. And she did. Not only is God going to save Lydia and change Lydia's heart, but watch what happens next here. Look at the next part of the story. You see, Lydia is saved. Her household is, is, uh, is baptized, saved and baptized. They go and stay with Lydia at her home with her family. But then guess what happens next? Look in verse 16. As we were going to the place of prayer again another day, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain for fortune telling. You see, what's going to happen here are two big things that are going to happen here in this next part of the story in Philippi. There is going to be a demon-possessed slave girl that's going to be redeemed or delivered, and then there's going to be persecution that's going to come after that. So look at the story of this demon-possessed slave girl this, one, this young girl's a slave, but I want you to notice two things about this, this young girl. She's not just a slave, part one. She's a slave in two ways. She's enslaved to those who own her, to those who are making money off of her because she's doing a little bit of fortune telling. But she's also a slave to who? Satan himself. She's double and she's enslaved in two different ways. She made her owners rich here on earth. And look at what it says again. It says in verse 16, that she brought her owners much gain from fortune telling. She followed Paul. Watch what she does. She follows Paul and, and us. Or she followed Paul and, and us, crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. So she just gets, she starts yelling these things. Every time that Paul would come out to the riverside, this, little, this girl would follow them out and just start yelling these things. Just start yelling it. 
Now, I want you to pick up on what's happening here. Satan himself, on the heels of Lydia getting saved, of the gospel now reaching the city of Philippi, Satan goes into full gear with this major distraction. And this young girl who is poor, who is enslaved by her owners, enslaved by Satan himself, is used by Satan as a pawn to begin to align what Paul is saying and doing with some kind of crazy occult on the side. Look at this crazy girl over here and what she's saying versus what Paul is doing and Silas is doing here as real gospel transformation is taking place. And so it is a common tactic of Satan to somehow even use the truth of what this young girl is saying to become a distraction, to pull people away from Jesus. And Satan is doing this work and is using her as a puppet and as a pawn. And Paul's had enough of it. And there in the story it says, uh, verse 18, and this she kept doing for many days, Paul having become greatly annoyed. He gets annoyed at it. He turns to the young girl and not to condemn the young girl, he condemns the spirit in the young girl. And watch what happens. Paul, having become greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, not to the young girl, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that very hour. Now you have a young, poor girl who has been delivered by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and now this young girl's changed forever. So changed that she has lost her value in the eyes of those who own her here on earth. She's no longer making the money. And so watch what happens. But when her owners, in verse 19, saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and drugged them into the marketplace before the rulers. You see, this demon-possessed, poor demon-possessed girl who is slaved in two different ways is now redeemed and released in from, from Satan himself, is changed forever. Now the prophet has dried up and the sights are now turned on the missionaries. Paul and Silas, Timothy, those that are there in this little team of people. And so in the wake of Lydia, Satan disrupts, does all of this work. And in that moment, in that space, they're drugged, they're beaten, they're falsely accused. And here are the two things that they're falsely accused of. They're disturbing the city, number one. And number two... They've brought this really crazy religion into our town that's disrupting things. All false allegations, but this is what is brought before them. They're brought before this little section or region of Philippi called the Bema. In fact, you can go there today, it's been excavated, and you can stand exactly where Paul took his beating. And it's there that Paul takes his worst beating as a missionary. He's beaten, he's flogged, and it's there he's beaten just simply because of these accusations of owners of this slave girl. Well, what happens? Well, they're thrown in jail is what happens. They're put in prison, but not just put in the exterior wall of the prison. They're put in the inner chamber of the prison, like the worst of the worst, like solitary confinement kind of thing. And they're put in the interior part of the prison so they have no way, no even no chance to escape there's no way they're going to escape. And here they are, shackled to a wall, sitting upright on a dirty, filthy floor in the middle of a prison. Now, I've got to tell you something. Let's just pause in the story for a, so for a second. That's rough. I mean, here's a man where all hope seems lost. In the face of beating, he's sore, blood still dried on his face. He's sore from the beatings themselves. He's beaten to a pulp. This was a man who was a person. This was someone who was somebody, if you know what I mean. He was on the, on the fast track of being the religious leader, the expert. He was the one that when Stephen was stoned, they put the, the, the cloaks down at his feet and he said yes. He's the one who had the plan to stomp out Christianity. This is a guy who was a rising leader among the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was a leader of leaders. This was somebody. No doubt he had a place where he lived, where he had good, uh, he, he never went without. He was completely taken care of, content, and satisfied until he met Jesus on the road. And now he finds himself in a city, in a place he's never been, beaten up, sore, sitting on a filthy floor of a prison in an interior 
building, shackled to a wall, what would you do? I'll tell you what Paul does. He begins to worship God. Watch what happens. It says, having received the order, he put them in in the inner prison and fastened their feet to the stocks. Look at verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, look at what they were doing. They're praying and they're singing hymns to God. (laughs) What, are you kidding me? They're praying and they're singing hymns to God. That's what it says. They were praying and they're singing hymns to God. They're worshiping and they're praying. And guess what begins to happen in that space, in that moment where they are so locked in on what God is doing. They're so content at what God is doing in their life. Watch what happens. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison was shaken and immediately the doors are open. Everyone's bonds are unfastened. Picture this. It's not just Paul and Silas who are innocent. It's those in the prison who are guilty. Those in the prison who have stolen things, those in the prison who have done things that were unjust to other people in Philippi, all of them are now unshackled. I don't know about you, if you've ever been through an earthquake, I haven't, but I don't know of any earthquake that just takes chains off of you. But somehow, some way, that happened. And all of the doors of the gates of the prison are open. Now, you gotta understand here, there's a jailer here, there's someone who's in charge of this facility, And this jailer has come to the end of his shift and he's made sure everything's locked up and he's gone to bed. Everything's locked up, everything is secure and he's now in bed until this earthquake happens. And when this earthquake happens, he then is startled and he comes about. It says in verse 27, when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. I want you to picture this scene. Not only do the gates or the, or the doors open and the chains all fall off, what happens here is this jailer's life is going to be literally transformed. He's literally going to go from the brink of death to life. Now watch this. Watch what happens in the story. This man, he, gets, he draws his sword out because here's the thing. When he's in charge, he is the man in the seat. He's in the chair. And all of the prisoners, he thinks, are now gone. Of course they're gone. If you opened up any prison, any jail, what would happen? Boom, they're all gone. They're everywhere. We're running for our lives. We're grabbing our guns. We're doing whatever we're going to do, right? To protect ourselves. Any prison, any jail, when it's wide open, of course, people are going to run for the hills. This jailer knows that. This jailer knows that he has one job, and his job is to keep those men in this facility. If he loses one, he's on the hook for it. He's going to lose his life anyway. Therefore, I'm going to take my sword out. I'm going to end my own life. And that's his thought process. He says, I'm not going to face the, 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 the man. I'm not going to face my boss. I'm going to go ahead and take my own life. He draws the sword out. He takes the sword. He's about to plunge it into himself or fall on it himself. And just about that time, in verse 30, then they brought them out, or in verse 29, and the jailer called the lights and rushed in because what he understands and realizes is that Paul cries out in verse 28, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Are you kidding me? We're all here. The jailer can't believe it. Of course, that's when in verse 29, he runs in, right? In verse 30, runs in with the lights. He sees and checks to see if they're all there. And what does he do? He falls down at the feet of those in solitary confinement, Paul and Silas. He falls down because he doesn't know what to do. He falls down before these men and begins to try to collect his thoughts. Verse 30 says, and then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What a question. Here's a man who's about to be dead by his own hand, who was literally rescued from that act to being spiritually transformed and radically changed forever. He goes from the brink of death to literal life. And he asked this most important question that we should all ask. Many of us in this room have asked. Some of us in this room may have never asked. And that is that question that he asks. What must I do to be saved? Because here's the thing. If you're that way, Paul and Silas, if you're believing in a God who who brings you to this conclusion, who gives you that kind of peace, who's worth worshiping even in the midst of all of the things that have happened to you in the city, I want some of that. I want some of that kind of life because whatever God has done in your life, he's never done in my life. And I want to understand how I can be saved just like you and Silas have been saved. And I love what Paul's response is. It's very simple. It's not overcomplicated. 
He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. They go back to his house. He took them in the same hour and night and he washed their wounds and he was baptized at once. It says within the hour, he's baptized. Within the hour, he, he, he not only engages a God who he's never really understood or heard of, he hears and sees a changed life in Paul and Silas. He then accepts the gospel of Jesus Christ, his entire household does, and then they're baptized. You can't get any crazier than that. But God does this supernatural work in the life of not only Lydia, not only a life of a, of a poor, demon-possessed girl, but also in the life of a Philippian jailer. What a scene. Which then leads here in Philippi to a church that starts. You see, the next morning, the magistrates show up. In verse 36, it says, the magistrates showed up, show up, and they say, let these men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul, and magistrates have said, hey, we're going to let you go. Isn't that exciting? Therefore, come on out and go in peace. Paul said, no, I'm not having any of this. Y'all beat me to a pulp. Do you know who we are? Maybe you, I didn't make myself clear, we're Roman citizens. Now, that was a no-no. That was an egregious offense. And he tells them, he holds them accountable, and he says, hey, listen, we're Roman citizens. Look at verse 39. They apologize. They took them out. They asked them to leave the city. And so what happens? Verse 40. So they went out of the prison, visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them, and they departed. Whew, what a story. You see, before Paul and Silas arrive, there is no church. When Paul and Silas leave in verse 40, there's a group of believers. And they're going to meet together. And they're going to begin a church. And that church is going to grow to the point so much so that Paul in Philippians chapter 1, as he writes this letter back to this church, is going to say, you are partners in the gospel. When I think about you and when I pray for you, I think of your stories. I think of how you could, were, were saved. I think of you, Philippian jailer. I think of you, this young slave girl who is now a part of the local church. I think of you, Lydia. I think of those of you in, your, in, their, in their households and the faces of when they accepted Jesus Christ and when they were baptized and how life began to flow into these homes and these households. And then they began to multiply themselves time and time again. And listen, church. When I think about this story, when we think about what God is doing here in Philippi, we need to understand the lesson, the takeaway, and it's this, that God wants you to follow his lead. God wants you to follow his lead. You see, he guides by his word, by way of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And let me say this this morning to us, that when you move from just simply hearing God to listening God with the intent to obey God, God works. When you begin to move into that stream of not just hearing what God says by reading his word, but listening with the intent of God, what do you want to do with my life? How do you want to lead me? How do you want to guide me by way of your Holy Spirit? Then that's when God begins to work in you and through you. That's when God begins to work in me and through me. That's when God begins to work in us and through us. You say, well, how does he do that? Well, I'll tell you, he does that in several ways. I want to point them out to us this morning. I think we can take away these things when it comes to how we listen to God. See, when you follow God, when you follow God with your life, you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit. That is one of the takeaways that we gain from Philippi. What's happening here, all that is happening is that the Spirit of God is at work here in the life of Paul and Silas. They're not doing anything on their own. They are, but they're simply living in the stream of God's obedience and submission to his spirit. He's the one who has stopped and shut the door from them going back east. He's the one who has opened the door for them to go west. He's the one who brings them into Philippi. He's the one that gathers them down to the, uh, to the riverside to meet Lydia. He's the one who then leads them to this young girl. He's the one who is doing the work of salvation. He's the one who is opening human hearts. He's the one who is changing their lives. They had a call. Their call was by way and, by, and directed by the Spirit of God. And we've seen this time and time again in Acts. You see, when the Spirit of God comes into our life through salvation, we get all of him. 
We don't get part of him. We don't get 10% of him. We don't get 50% of him. We get all of him. 100% of the presence of Jesus, the Spirit of God who lives inside of us now. But he's now beginning to direct us. He begins to guide us. He begins to lead us. We've seen this in Acts, in Acts chapter 4, when, uh, when, with the, uh, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. And there he is, they, he's led to this man who wants to hear the word of God, and then he is radically cha- is saved. We've seen this time and time again as he is directing these men from town to town to different places. God is beginning to do this work. The reality is the Spirit of God's the one leading this trip. The Spirit of God's the one who is guiding them. And here's the deal. When it comes to you as a Christian, by prayer and fasting and the preaching of the Word of God, God begins to move. God begins to lead. He begins to direct. Gospel ministry is God-led. It's not man-led. It is God-led. And when we obey the call of Christ to pray and to give and to go, but, but the Lord's the one who leads. The, war, the Lord's the one who's guiding us. And here is the key to the Christian life. When we are led, when you, when you choose to follow God's lead, you're going to be led by the Holy Spirit. And the key is this, is gaining the sensitivity to the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. We want to pray for, and you ought to pray for the sensitivity. God, make me more sensitive to how you are leading in my life. He doesn't do that arbitrarily. He doesn't do that just simply by eating, you know, eating breakfast. He does it by way of his word and how he is guiding and directing us in our life. But it is essential to gospel growth. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, greatest chapter in all of the Bible, many argue. Romans chapter 8. It's where the Spirit of God, we learn about the Spirit of God and what the work, the person and the work of the Spirit of God in our life. Romans chapter 8, verse 9 speaks of the fact that the Spirit of God has to be necessary to bring about salvation in you. You are not born again. I'm not born again without the Spirit of God coming in and radically changing me from the inside out. It's not about me dressing up and looking the part. It is about, about me being completely transformed from the inside out. And when I'm transformed from the inside out, everything begins to change. How I think, how I live, how I look at life. And what the Spirit of God does is he comes into my life, he brings me freedom. He brings about and ushers in holiness in my life. He leads me to truth in my life. He gives me access to the Father. He's the one who gives me assurance of my salvation when I'm struggling, whether I'm even saved or not. He's the one who brings me back to the assurance of salvation. He's the one who gives me the courage and the ability to witness and to share Christ with other people. He's the one who gives me this insatiable joy in the Christian life. He is the one who brings about this spiritual renewal in my life, right? He's the one who bears that spiritual fruit in me, that love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that goodness, that faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All of those things come by way of the Spirit of God who is bringing and, and brings this new birth in me. How am I sensitive now to the Spirit of God, though? Because I can have all of the Holy Spirit and not follow Him. And therein lies the key. You see, we can have the Spirit of God, but to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit, I've got to give him the keys of my life in the sense that he's not some God who was shoved in the backside of my house, locked away. He has full and complete reign of my life in my house. God, what is it that you want to do in me and through me? This is why Paul, when Paul gives this the instruction to be filled with the Spirit, it's not as though you have 50% and you need another 50% of the Spirit of God. You have all of the Spirit, but he may not have all of you in that moment. And you need to be submissive to whatever God he wants to, you want to do in me, wherever you want to take me, however you want to lead me. And when he has that, he has your undivided attention, he has your listening ear, He knows you're willing to obey him, to do whatever he wants to do, say whatever he wants to say, go wherever he wants to go. That is a place where God wants to lead us. And therefore, when we are being led by God, then we are being led by the Spirit. And that's why Paul and Silas, we see this over and over again from stop to stop to stop. When we're led by God, we're not only being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and listening to the Holy Spirit, but guess what's going to happen? When you are following God's lead, he's going to then transform the lives of the unexpected. He's going to transform lives of people around you and through you that you would never even expect to be saved. I want you to think about what God is doing here, what Luke is doing here as he's putting these three stories together for us. There's three people in this entire story that have been radically changed. One 
is a very wealthy businesswoman. Two is a very poor, demon-possessed young girl. Three is a blue-collar man who runs a shift at a jail. And all three of them, when Paul and Silas leave Philippi, are part of the same church. Are you kidding me? They're sitting together, and they're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ together. They're getting together at the riverside when Paul and Silas are saying, y'all, bye, y'all. And now they're worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ together. Listen, that is what God does. If there's people in your life, if there's people around your life that haven't given their life to Jesus, and you see them and you think, man, there's no way God's going to save that person, hang on. Because God can save those people. God can work in human hearts. He can open up human hearts. God is doing this work. He's done it in us, hasn't he? Amen. He does it around us. So when you follow God's lead, then you, you're in this stream of his obedience. Then he's going to transform human hearts that are unexpected. When you follow God's lead, listen, there may be a cost. That's the cost that Paul and Silas had to incur. None of this happens if Paul and Silas are not willing to do and to incur whatever happens to them. And they are beaten, in this case, severely. In fact, it tells us over in Philippians, when Paul is writing back to this church, and he writes to them about his experience, he says to them in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He put it all on the line. And he knew and understood that there would be cost, and he had experienced cost. The Philippians, as they're reading this letter, remember, oh yeah, I remember. In order for Paul to have reached this Philippian jailer, he had to be beaten and flogged and thrown in here and locked up. And this man who was sitting here with his family in his living room going, telling the tales of Paul. You remember when Paul had to be beaten? Well, he was beaten, and God used all of that to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to our living room. And here we are. You see, sometimes when you follow God, there's going to be this cost that is going to be incurred in our life. But what God says is that we are to leverage our lives. We are to leverage the years that God gives us here on earth to risk it all, to simply follow Jesus simply with our life. Let me give you one more. And it's this, that when we follow the Lord's lead by his power and through our obedience, he establishes his will God is working and moving through Paul and Silas, isn't he? He's fulfilling what he wants. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Go into all the world and make disciples. He said to them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There at the ends of the earth. And what God's doing is he's fulfilling his will, but he fulfills his will through his people as well. He, when he takes his people who are yielded to him, who are listening to the, to the, have a sensitivity to his Holy Spirit and his word, when are willing to say, yes, whatever God you want, we need more of you, God. We want to do what you want us to do. And he has our undivided attention, and we've gone from just hearing him to listening to him with the intent to obey. He's fulfilling his will time and time again. I'm reminded of that old story in 1 Samuel. We're familiar with it, right? Saul. What happens to old Saul? Saul was the first king of Israel. Starts out gangbusters. He's tall. He's good looking. He fits the part. He's what they wanted. But there's a problem in Saul's heart. Saul likes to follow his own will versus God's will. Saul gets to a place of self-reliance in his heart to where he likes the idea of following the prophet Samuel. He likes the idea of following God. But when God does not deliver, I'm going to plan B. And you know what plan B is? I'm taking matters into my own hands. We're going to get this done. I mean, God, you didn't show up. We're going to get this done. And Saul fails time and time again. And it tells us in 1 Samuel chapter, or Samuel himself says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, God says this, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying 
the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. It's like, listen, you can go through all the religious rituals. God is pleased with those, but he is more so pleased when we are at a place in our hearts of full and complete and full-throated obedience. Always follow the Lord's leading. How do you do that? Through prayer, learning how to fast, what the Bible says about that, listening to what the word of God says with the intent to obey. You should listen to Psalm 119, first three verses. This is what the psalmist says. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Listen, church, that's what God wants for you. That's what God wants for me. If you're sitting out there this morning and you're a Christian, that's what God wants from you. He wants your complete and full, yielded, to his voice, obedience. He wants you to follow him. That's what God wants for you. Question is, is that you? Maybe you need to recommit to that. Maybe we need to commit to that as a church. Because that's what God wants. That's what he wants for me. That's what he wants for my family. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for your marriage. That's what he wants for your family. That's what he wants for your kids is this full and complete, yielded to his voice. Do you get to the point in your life where you're listening to what the word of God says by way of the spirit of God who's leading and guiding you? And as he's doing these things, he's working, he's working. He's working in you, he's working through you, he's working ahead of you, he's working around you, he's working behind you after you've left because you were obedient to him. And that's what God wants. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to give you the chance to do that this morning. As Christians, God wants you this morning to commit yourself to following his lead. But for those of you this morning that are not followers of Jesus yet, he wants you to give your life to him. You know God loves you. He cares deeply for your life. He loved you enough to create you and make you and bring you into this world. The problem with your life is that your problem is the same problem that I have. We're broken people. We're sinners. We've gone away from God. And because of that, God says you cannot be in my presence because of your sin, because of your brokenness. Which is why God sent his son Jesus to die for your sins on the cross, to be buried but to rise from the dead. He died the death that you deserve. He carried the cross. He did the work. And what he offers you this morning is eternal life, an abundant life here on earth now. But he wants you to believe. And there is that question for the jailer. What must I do to be saved? Maybe that's a question you're asking this morning. Well, listen to what the word of God says, what Paul says from a prison floor. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you can be saved. Just simply believe. I want to ask our worship team to come forward as they lead us this morning. If you're here this morning and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here at the front. If you want to say, hey, Pastor Sonny, I want to believe in Jesus today. I want to be saved. Then you come. You come here at the front. I'll be here at the front. If you want to come and pray over any matter, I'll be here at the front. If you want to come and join our church or you want to surrender to baptism today, you come. That's God's will for you. There are many things that God wants you to do with his word. You never walk away from it, though, without saying yes to him. So say yes to him. I'm going to pray and we'll stand and sing. God, thank you this morning for your word and how you lead and guide us. God, we love you and we thank you for this time that we have to respond to your word. Lord, your word is clear. You want us to follow your lead, no matter where it takes us. And so would you lead us? Would you guide us? Because we need you. We need you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. 
We would love to invite you if you're ever in the Livingston area to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.